Good afternoon, everyone, and happy St. Patrick's Day. We are thrilled to have you join us for our first webinar in the series, Keys to Early Season Soybean Success. And this is hosted by the United Soybean Supported Science for Success team. My name is Rachel Van, and I am the Soybean Extension Specialist at NC State University. And I am joined by my colleagues from all across the United States. The Science for Success team has 22 states represented. And we work together to collaboratively deliver soybean best management practices. And speaking of our states, the first thing we'd like to do in this webinar is kick off a poll so we know where, what states all the attendees here today represent. So we are starting this poll, what state are you from? And we'll give you about 30 seconds to respond to this poll. The Science for Success team collaboratively delivers soybean best management practices to US soybean farmers using a variety of mechanisms. One of the things that we do is we summarize existing and ongoing state supported soybean research and leverage our knowledge that we have as agronomists in our individual states to create national extension publications. And the focus of the webinar today is one of those national extension publications we released earlier in 2023. We also collaboratively deliver best management practices through conducting common protocol research trials across the US annually and those range on a variety of topics, anywhere from end fixation to foliar fertilizers to soil health or biological seed treatments. And so that's another mechanism by which we deliver best management practices. So at this point, I'm going to end the poll and share the results about where folks said they were from. Uh, and we have folks from all over the United States uh, present at the webinar today. And hopefully you can see some of these results. So with that, we would like to kick off the webinar, which is focused on when early planting doesn't work out, do I replant, repair plant, or leave this pitiful stand? And our facilitator for our webinar today is Dr. Sean Conley, the soybean specialist at the University of Wisconsin-Madison, who's joined by our colleagues, Dr. Laura Lindsay at The Ohio State University, Dr. Jeremy Ross, University of Arkansas, and Dr. Manny Singh at Michigan State University. And our goal is to have regional representation for the soybean producing regions across the US. So at this point, I will kick it over to Dr. Sean Conley to facilitate this webinar. Thank you, Dr. Van, uh, and welcome everyone. And I'd like to echo Rachel's um, welcome to uh, St. Patrick's Day. As you can tell by name, my name's Sean Conley. I'm about as Irish as they get, and I know everyone is Irish today. So hopefully we'll be able to go out and enjoy some corned beef and cabbage. I've got that in the crock pot right now. So when I get home, I'll, I'll be able to experience that myself with my family. So as we get kicked off today with this whole question about replant decisions and when do we repair plant or when do we um, you know, start over from scratch? One of my questions I always ask people is, at what plant stain um, do you need to basically consider this action? Either when do you pull the trigger of either starting over from scratch or filling in some holes? So what I wanna do right now is take a minute and kind of pull the group out there because I know we have participants anywhere from Louisiana to North Carolina, Ohio to uh, North Dakota in here today. So. Uh, I think we're going to start a, a quick poll um, and ask you all, when do you decide to uh, make that decision to go through and um, make that stand when you when you, you uh, replant and what's the threshold for you on your farm? And as that poll information comes in, I think one of the things we need to consider is, you know, first thing is, how do we assess that amount of loss? And I remember back when I was younger, we would always have the hula hoop method when we used to have narrow rows. We'd have to understand the, you know, the area of that circle. Uh, as we've gone to uh, wider rows, we've gone to utilize more of, you know, pulling a tape a certain, a certain distance 
either in 15s, 20s, 30s, or 38 inch rows, depending on where you are across the country. But as we've ad adapted to new technologies, we have things such as Bean Cam, it's a free app you can download on your iPhone or Android to take pictures. Or now we've moved to um, some of these in season sensors, either mounted directly on a sprayer or utilizing a uh, drone. So there's lots of different areas here. So what I think we'll do is just kind of get a sense right now of where to kind of end this poll. And it looks like a majority of those um, in the audience are roughly, the replant threshold is at 70 to 80K. So that's kind of a threshold that we see out there across the country. And I think what we can do is look at where we are and it kind of matches what we, we've been doing. So either our recommendations have been heard or we're listening to your recommendations because we kind of align. and. For the most part in the southern part of the country. Uh, by that, I would say I-70 and south, most farmers and agronomists are looking in that 50 to 60,000 plants that are evenly distributed. Um, that's where that kind of a threshold is. And as we move further north into Wisconsin, Minnesota, and North Dakota, we're looking more at that 75,000 plants per acre. It's kind of that threshold where we've been able to do that. And then it's funny if we look here at some of the farmers and crop consultants, I think we would all agree that that threshold has changed quite a bit, uh, given today's modern genetics and how early we're planting. We'll kind of talk a little bit about that uh, as we go through today's webinar. Um, the next question we say is, okay, obviously it's usually not a uniform stand. So at what, uh, how do we assess that pattern of loss? And generally what we look for is we consider an action and that action is either replanting or filling in a thin stand in that six to 10 square feet size. So if we have holes that big, that's generally where that action threshold is established in. So I think there's a lot of things to, uh, to consider when we're making this decision to repair plant. Uh, by repair plant, that's uh, the definition we're using here is you plant into an existing stand or we start over. Uh, I think the first thing we do is look at the plant's ability to recover, what's the calendar date, uh, what are the weed management implications, uh, seed availability, uh, what is that cost that you as a farmer is going to occur versus what's going to be covered with crop insurance, and ultimately we have to bring that all in and look at that yield penalty and how does that pencils out. So these are the big points we're going to kind of walk through today and if you have any questions, uh, feel free to drop those in the chat. Uh, when we're done today, we'll ask I'll be moderating this session and I'll ask the panelists uh, to be able to go through across the different regions to address any questions you all might have here in the audience today. So the first thing we wanna talk about is what is the existing plant ability to recover? And again, we have to understand that soybean is kind of an interesting crop and in that it has a significant amount of phenotypic plasticity that it's able to regrow, uh, grow into areas and, and kind of fill in gaps. And on the simplest terms, if we look at this plant right here, and this is a VC plant, you can see here we have the, uh, the cotyledons and the unifoliate leaves. And if you look at this plot, the plant in the simplest terms, we actually have five growing points effectively happening on this plant. We have here the terminal meristem, but then in each one of these leaf, leaf axles, we have axillary meristem. That way, if we have any damage, to either the apical meristem, we lose in the unifoliate leaves, or the, you know, the stem above the cotyledons, we can get regrowth at, at any one or each one of these different leaf axles. And I think that's the important thing to understand is that plant's ability to recover. And I think we've seen this with frost injury, uh, with wildlife or insect damage, broken plants through uh, making a pass across the field, uh, with uh, equipment specifically going out there and maybe filling in some thin areas. But if we break the stem above the cotyledons in these early uh, vegetative growth stages, there's generally no yield loss associated with damage at that point. Uh, we've done a lot of work across the country with um, insurance companies and looking at you know, implementing damage. So again, for the most part, we generally see very little damage or yield loss in the vegetative growth stages to be it frost or insect damage or chemical drift, as long as the, the axillary meristems at the cotyledons or above remain intact. One of the areas that we can see flooding, excuse me, damage occur is in flooding, specifically in the southern, but 
Uh, even in the north, um, the flooding impact, and a lot of that is dictated by the duration of the flooding and how warm it is at that time. And I know breeders in the Mid-South and South have put a lot of energy and emphasis into developing flood tolerant varieties that can withstand three or four or five days of, of submergence. So I think there's a lot of things to think about, but if we just really focus in on understanding the plant phenology and these where these meristems exist, it really helps us go through and make that assessment of what that yield loss may actually occur at different vegetative growth stages. I mean, ultimately, what really has been driving part of this is what is the, the impact of calendar date? And if we see this is some data we've collected across the north central region, uh, from both North Dakota all the way down to uh, Ohio and Nebraska to Michigan, and looking at the what is the impact of uh, planting delay on yield penalties. And if we see here, for most of our locations, we're starting somewhere by, by between um, April 10th and April 25th for planting dates. And we see anywhere from a, a 1.4 bushel per acre per week yield penalty by delayed planting, all the way up to a 2.8 bushel per acre per day planting. So the reason we bring this to your attention is unless there's some pretty significant damage, we really strongly encourage farmers to plant into an existing stand. And the reason for that is even if you've got 35,000, 40,000 plant stand out there, those 40,000 plants are going to have a higher yield potential because they're planting planted anywhere from a week to two weeks earlier. So again, that's why we're really pushing farmers to not go through and start over from scratch, but go in and plant into an, extent, uh, into an existing stand. So there's a lot of other caveats that are involved with this, and we'll kind of try and cover all those. And the next caveat we're going to be talking to about is weed management. So at this point, I'd like to... Uh, Bring in Dr. Jeremy Ross uh, from Arkansas because they have all sorts of fun weeds that they get to deal with in the South and Mid South. So, Jeremy, they're all yours. Appreciate it, Sean. And yeah, this is probably one of the the biggest uh, questions I get every spring is is on you know what do I need to do with my stands if I've got you know reduced. Uh, plant stands in my fields. But, you know, the, the biggest issue that we probably deal with here in the Mid-South is our weed management and trying to, you know, really control the weeds and especially in, in situations where we have, you know, canopies that are less than ideal is, is, not, is not fun and sometimes it costs a little bit more money. And so, you know, when we're looking at the weed situation, you know, we don't have these complete canopy closures. Uh, they may be delayed or never reached. And so, you know, when we're looking at our weed management issues in these open canopies, you know, more light is, is able to penetrate that canopy and reach the soil surface. And so therefore, uh, you know, more than likely we're gonna have a bigger problem with, you know, trying to control those weeds uh, if, if we, you know, ha haven't had um, you know, a really good canopy closure. So, you know, when we're looking at that, we may have to come back in with additional applications and that's going to cost us more money. We're going to have to be more timely with those applications. And so we're really going to have to be scouting these fields and make sure we get, you know, those weeds under control because uh, there's a whole host of, of research out there that shows that, you know, weed competition can really uh, affect our final yields. Uh, especially with palmer amaranth and some of our more uh, common weeds that we tend to want, you know have to to really combat uh, throughout the season some other you know, things that we need to consider especially you know when we're looking at these open canopies is in our irrigated fields the irrigation efficiency is going to be less in these fields just because again sunlight is able to penetrate that canopy and we're having more evaporation so therefore our efficiency is going to be reduced. Uh, we're going to have to spend more money and more time on trying to irrigate these fields to, to make sure we got adequate water available out there to really maximize that crop. And then, you know, and then here in the Mid-South, you know, especially once we get later in the season, um, corn earworms tend to want to focus on fields that have open canopies. And so therefore, if we have a field that has open canopy, we may need to scout those fields a little bit earlier. Uh, we may need to come back in and treat those fields earlier than normal if we had a you know a complete canopy closure and in some situations we may have to put on multiple applications of an insecticide just to try to control that particular pest 
And then the next thing we really need to kind of, you know, ask ourselves is, you know, if we do have these problems, you know, what is the the seed and the variety availability once we get in into the, the planting season? And so, you know, if we're looking at, you know, a free or reduced cost replanting situation, you know, we need to question, you know, how long is it going to be before we can actually get that seed to, on the farm and into the planter to try to, you know, either fill in or come back in with a replant. You know, the longer uh, it's delayed, as uh, Sean just showed in the, those, the slide on the planting dates, as we delay planting, our uh, maximum yield is reduced. And so if it's going to take us two to three weeks to get this seed in, you know, we're just, you know, we're losing maximum yield and we may not be able to maximize, you know, what we have <clears throat> out there. You know, and then the question is, especially on some of our more popular uh, varieties, you know, can we even get the seed that we planted? Uh, many times, you know, especially on some of these more popular varieties, uh, some of the newer varieties, uh, you know, they may be spoken for and we're not able to get the exact variety that we planted originally and then come back in with a replant. So we really need to kind of look at, you know, other varieties and try to, you know, find the best, you know, the best options that we have available out there. And, you know, probably the biggest question that I get is, you know, if we do have to come back in and either fill in or come back in with a replant, you know, what maturity groups do we need to look at, uh, you know, to try to have an even harvest? And so really that's a hard question to answer because depending on, you know, how long that original uh, planting has been emerged and growing, and then when we can come back in with that second or, or uh, you know, the fill-in planting, you know, it's really difficult to really try to mix and match different maturity groups to really get a good, even harvest. And so typically, you know, you want to try to stick with, you know, something that's pretty close to what the maturity group was that, the, that you originally planted in that field. And then probably the biggest thing and you know, I've seen this happen in the past is we really need to confirm, you know, what herbicide traits we have. And so we don't want to mix and match our herbicide traits, especially if you're talking about, you know, the dicamba and extend flex uh, technology versus the enlist, because, you know, there are certain uh, herbicides that will, you know, uh, you know, kill uh, different technologies. So we need to really confirm that we have the, the proper herbicide technology in there. And then probably the biggest thing we need to keep in mind is a lot of our pre-emerge herbicides have, you know, maximum use rates throughout the season. And most of the time we, you know, reach those uh, use rates, you know, early in the season. And if we have to come back in with a replant, you know, some of those herbicides we will not be able to use just because we've reached the, the year long use rates for that particular herbicide. So we may have to mix and match Look at other different herbicide technologies and other different herbicides if we do have to come back in and uh, you know look at a replant situation. So now I'd like to pass it off on to, to Dr. Laura Lindsay at the University of, or the Ohio <laughs> State University. There you go. The, away, the Ohio State. The yeah, Ohio right. State. <laughs> yep. Yep. Well, thanks for the introduction. Uh, I'm really happy to join the webinar today. Uh, when you're thinking about replanting soybeans, there are several questions you need to ask yourself and maybe reach out to others and ask questions about, um, is your seed covered? So you may need to reach out to your seed dealer uh, to see what your options are for even replanting uh, soybean in your field. And there are a lot of additional costs to planting, time, labor. Uh, what was your seed treatment? We know seed treatments can be very costly. So this is another factor uh, that needs to be considered. Oftentimes in Ohio, when we plant really early, so maybe end of March, first week of April, oftentimes our stands are reduced. Uh, they could be anything between soil crusting, slugs, diseases, wet weather, uh, multiple problems that can all occur. Uh, but with these earlier planting dates, you may need to check your insurance coverage to see what, what is indeed covered uh, for you based on your, your planting date. Go to the next slide, perfect. Uh, so this slide uh, shows a, a couple of figures from Dr. Sean Conley. So if I mess up the explanation, you can feel free to, to ask him questions during the uh, Q&A session. Uh, but basically, you know, as farmers, you have multiple fields that need to be planted. And you also have to decide planting priority, corn or soybean. So both crops do 
have reductions in yield for delayed planting. Uh, this first uh, figure here uh, shows uh, projected gross return uh, for corn and soybeans. And basically this is, um, this information is based on modeling and fields in Wisconsin. So it may not be applicable to every state in the same way. Uh, but basically in Wisconsin, uh, what they saw with this modeling effort was soybeans really should be planted first before corn until a certain date. And so that date is about date 112 and that corresponds to April 22nd. Once you hit April 22nd, um, it's better than to switch and plant corn. And really that's because of the second figure here. So with both crops, corn and soybean, yield does decline as you plant later, but that decline is steeper uh, for corn compared to soybean. So when you're thinking about replanting, also think what other crops need to be planted that year and what fields have yet to be planted. And just anecdotally, um, in Ohio, I talked to a farmer earlier this week who had a poor stand last year. Uh, he said it was the ugliest yield ever. Um, but he didn't replant right away because he had other fields that needed to be planted. So he went and he planted his other corn fields, his other soybean fields. By the time he circled back to replant, he felt it was too late and he just left the field go. And then he told me that that was one of his highest yielding soybean fields. So having that earlier planting date and maybe not great stand, um, oftentimes will be more beneficial than having a later planting date and a perfect stand. So I'm gonna turn it over to uh, Dr. Singh. Uh, Manny is the uh, soybean, I guess, cropping system agronomist at Michigan State University. All right, thanks, Laura. Uh, I'm gonna try to take it home here. And I think a lot of the points I'll talk about have been covered by, by others, right? And in terms of answering this question of uh, cost of doing nothing, I think the key is uh, our recommendation has always been, you know, wait, wait at least a week or so, right? The stand might be looking pretty ugly out there, as Laura was just talking about that uh, example of a farmer from Ohio, right? Waiting is very critical, uh, and then going back and sculpting that field before we decide, you know, what to do. And that's where probably are we going to do nothing and leave it uh, on what we have out there, or are we going to go ahead and do a repair plant, or do we have to replant, right? And uh, this again, do nothing uh, sort of goes against human psychology. I have been guilty of probably that as well. You know, you go out and uh, your, your plots are looking really bad and you, you don't want them to look bad because you don't want uh, the next door person uh, thinking you're not on top of things, right? As a researcher, and I'm sure it's true for you all as well as a, as a farmer, right? But if we really are keening on this, uh, profitability piece at the end of the day, right? What is going to maximize dollars in, in the pocket? I think uh, waiting and uh, sculpting that stand is really critical in terms of making that decision, you know, what to do. And even if we are leaving the, the what we have out there, there are other things we can do management-wise, right? Uh, Jeremy was talking about that. Uh, we might have these open canopies, especially if we are in... Uh, uh, like a 30 inch row, row spacing, right? And uh, we might have to change our herbicide program, right? Uh, so scouting uh, and maybe changing other management based on what we have out there might trump uh, needing to, to replant. Because again, I think Sean touched on that. We are again, pretty much a, a, a race against time there, right? Every extra day, we are getting that delayed planting penalty. And it's not linear that, that the response, right? Uh, the further uh, delayed we are, the more uh, bushels we, we are losing. So, so again, I think that the key message here is uh, think about profitability and maybe not go to the field for a couple of days because it might look ugly out there. Next slide, Sean. Uh, so again, I think this uh, figure, a uh, uh, couple of images here sort of uh, uh, talks about that, the point I was trying to, to make here. This is a a uh, couple of pictures from uh, Sean's plots out in Wisconsin where you can see what the stand is looking like uh, a really low uh, population, around 40,000 seats uh, versus uh, a relatively high stand, uh, 140,000 or, or so. If you can see some of the, the numbers down here at the, at the bottom, they're tracking how much canopy closure was out there based on, on, on when, when the pictures were, were taken, right? And you can see early on uh, in early June and even towards end of June, there was a difference. 
that lower uh, seeding rate has a less canopy cover. But by the time we roll towards the middle of July, uh, that's when we want the canopy to be closed, right? Uh, it's uh, idly by the time uh, maybe we start a uh, pod formation. And you can see by the mid-July or so, both canopies uh, are, are closed, right? We are intercepting almost 99% of, of light uh, out there. So again, this, how does this look like for a for a, a given farmer? That's uh, that that that's kind of tricky. And again, our recommendation generally is leave a, a strip out there. Just like if we are recommending a relatively lower uh, seeding rate, we will ask people. You know, the optimal rate maybe depends on your yield limiting factors in your field. So leave a couple of strips out there if you decide to do nothing. Because again, if we do replant or uh, Repair plant, that does cost us money. And even if uh, uh, you have some insurance, there is still time involved. And then there's equipment and uh, other depreciation cost, right? So again, soybeans can be pretty forgiving. Others have touched on that and I will re-emphasize that, right? Due to that phenotypic plasticity, we sometimes just need to give them a little time and, and see how, how, how things are looking out there. All right, so just to wrap it up, uh, I think we want to leave plenty of time for questions here. Uh, as I think everyone has emphasized, a lot of times the best decision might be doing nothing, right? Again, it goes against human psychology, but uh, a lot of uh, universities, uh, states are finding that out in their uh, research that that might be the best case uh, in general. Uh, if we are uh, below some thresholds, it's very critical to know these thresholds. The poll uh, Sean put out to show the 70 to 80 number, right? Uh, it might uh, vary based on where, where you are. So based on that, uh, the next best option might be to repair plant. Uh, and only in very few cases, uh, uh, the replant is probably going, going to be beneficial. And if you are way below that threshold, that again is, is going to be economically profitable as well. So, so just I think a sort of thinking step-by-step -step approach uh, of what decision to, to make while keeping the profitability piece uh, at, the, at, at, at the top is, is critical. And uh, you can see a couple of other information over here. Uh, you can see the QR code. Uh, this, and uh, I assume we'll uh, put a link in the, in the chat box here. This will uh, take you to this uh, publication uh, that we did uh, uh, here a couple of months ago, working as a, as a group that Rachel was talking about, and it has data from, from multiple states and it really focuses on uh, a lot of things that, that, that we discussed here in terms of uh, when uh, do we make these decisions, uh, leaving the, the stand it is uh, uh, and going for repair plant or going for a, for a, a, a replant. So I'll, I'll highly recommend you to, to check that out. Excellent. With that, yeah, I'll turn it back to, 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 to you, Sean. Thanks, Manny. Um, so uh, Laura, Jeremy, and Manny, I'll be uh, facilitating the questions in the Q&A right now, and I'll encourage all of the participants, if they have any questions, feel free to drop them in the Q&A. And what I'll do is I'll kind of read each question, then I'll, <clears throat> I'll identify a speaker to cover those. And then if either one of the other two would like to uh, jump on in and add more context, especially given the areas that we're traveling from the south, mid-south to the north. So I think there's a lot of variation we could see that might be of interest for the audience. So the first question that we had is, what is your recommendation on a relative maturity for early planted soybeans? So I guess it comes back to that question. If you're planting your beans early, what do you go put an early bean out there? Do you put a late bean, stick with normal? Uh, let's start with Jeremy in the south, and then uh, we'll go to Laura further north. Jeremy, you're first. Thanks, Sean. So when we're talking about you know maturity groups and our early planted uh, system, um, you know we've done quite a bit of work. Dr. Larry Purcell uh, did a regional study that was funded by the Mid South Soybean Board a few years ago, and and it's really sticking with our you know group fours. You know we can go with our you know a little bit earlier group fours. You know probably less than four point five, uh, but you know the yield. In when we looked at threes, fours, fives, and sixes, really the the yield potential was still you know kind of in that wheelhouse of our our group four. So 
I wouldn't go too early. We've got some uh, producers that, you know, grows to maybe late, late threes. Um, but, you know, majority of our early planted stuff is still going to probably be, you know, you know, a point or two off of what you typically want to plant uh, under your full season uh, scenarios. Yeah, I'll chime in about Ohio. Uh, I guess the, the rule of thumb here is to plant the longest maturing soybean variety that won't die in a frost, right? So that's a little bit challenging because you never know when that, that frost will be. Uh, but basically, that, that's kind of the rule of thumb. Uh, the southern portion of the state, um, group threes, group fours are fine. And, you know, in the northern part of the state as well, a group three would be absolutely fine. Um, we also encourage farmers, though, to think about their plans after slaving. Uh, so in Ohio, uh, farmers may want to go a little bit earlier with their relative maturity. Uh, if they want to plant a cover crop or winter green or winter wheat or some other uh, fall grain. Um, and I know Manny, he's done some work with relative maturity and planting date in Michigan. So he has more data than me. Uh, so I'll let him also talk about this. Yeah, so yeah, as Laura said, we have done some work on, on that aspect. So again, I think the focus is on the northern production systems, right? And that's different than probably what Jeremy was talking. We have seen the benefit if we are pushing planting early. And here in Michigan, I'm talking like last week of April or first week of May. That's where if you go a, to a longer bean, so what we call a late maturing variety, right? So like in Lansing area where I am, two, five is our typical. And uh, we have seen like if you push to maybe a three or a max of three, five, because again, you want it to, to mature before frost, uh, what Laura was talking about. We have seen that uh, a benefit of increased in yield is coming from more number of nodes and pots and number of seeds per unit area, and then having a longer reproductive phase. So you're getting more beans and you're maintaining their seed weight. But again, that approach doesn't work if, uh, you, based on your cropping system, if you're putting wheat behind, and we have, uh, again, uh, a good portion of our soybean area going into wheat. There, again, uh, we are now even starting to look uh, in the new project, you know, can we use some desiccants, you know, to 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 sort of uh, take that, uh, those beans out. Uh, uh, we have some work here on dry beans where, where uh, that has shown some, some, some benefit. So that approach has worked for us uh, in our typical planting time. We, that's mid-May, we generally don't see a relation, uh, much of a relation between relative maturity and yield. But under early plantings, we have seen that and uh, and, and seen a, a yield bump of anywhere from uh, two to three, four bushels, uh, just, just going with, uh, with a late bean. Thank you all. And what I'll do is I'll kind of flip it. We'll go north to south with this next question. And the next question is, how does the replant decision or how is the replant decision affected by row spacing? I guess the question is if you have seven and a half, 15s or 30s, does that change it? Or do we stick with something similar to what we talked about today in this webinar? So Manny, I'll let you kick it off. Uh, so we have done uh, a row spacing study where the question we were asking was, uh, we typically see benefit of narrow rows in like mid planting or especially in delayed planting scenarios, right? So how about early planting where the idea is if you're in 30 inches, uh, you have seeds closer to each other, right? So they might be able to like push out if there's a soil crust or, or something. The last three years of data, we have seen benefit of narrow row spacing, even under early planting. I think the last year we did not, and we had some crusting issues. So I think there's some truth to that, but we have seen benefit of going or staying with the narrow row spacing, even under early planting conditions. And another thing we have looked at, I think just on, on that same topic, if we're planting early, how critical is our seed placement? Uh, and I think what we have seen is that uh, in corn, it really pays to have the precise seed placement, right? Uh, singulation and, and all, all, all of that. But in, in soybeans, they're more forgiving and you don't need that real uniform stand. And again, that comes back to the replanting thing, right? That even if the plants are not at the same stage in soybeans, that's probably okay. So I think we, my my thinking would be to to stay with narrow row spacing so for early early planting and even even for a, for a replant. Um, Jeremy, I'll push it down to the south. So, you know, when we're looking at you know different row spacings, you know, Arkansas and the mid south, you know, we're all the way from broadcast to 
38, 40 inches on some of our cotton soils. And so we have a, you know, a wide range of different, you know, row spacings that we deal with. And so, you know, if I had my preference, you know, I would be less than 30. We've got a lot of data showing that, you know, we, we have higher yield potentials on row spacings less than 30. And especially once we kind of get into that seven and a half, 15 inch row spacings, even at those reduced plant stands, you know, we can get better canopy closure than we do on something that's, you know, 36, 38. And so, you know, if you are on those narrow rows and configurations, you know, your replant decisions may be a little bit easier to, to look at just because you've got, you know, more of the, of the soil covered, you know, on those lower uh, row spacings than you do on something wide. And so, uh, you know, majority, you know, especially, you know, a lot of our rice type soils were on, you know, 30s or less. And so, um, you know, I think those decisions are going to be better or easier to, to answer on the narrow rows than they are on the wider rows. Thanks, Jeremy. All right, Dr. Laura Lindsay, I'll throw the next one at you because mm -hmm. my favorite questions. All right. Do you recommend planting a soybean with seed treatment when replanting? How late into the season do you include that seed treatment? And that, that's a really good question. So I did talk about there is a cost with the seed treatment. So someone was paying attention. So I appreciate that. Um, so I think, you know, it depends to what seed treatment are you talking about? There's different types of seed treatments and what are you targeting or what's your problem that you're trying to control? So think about that um, in terms of biological seed treatments. You probably don't need that. You can you can drop that out. Um, there's also fungicides, insecticides. So in, in the case of fungicides, um, you may still need a fungicide depending on your soil type and the disease history in your field. So only you really know that if you have routine problems with um, Phytophthora or Epithium or one of those diseases um, under wet conditions, um, you still may want your fungicide. Although when you do plant later, oftentimes your soil is drier. So it is location dependent and field dependent. Um, so I guess consider, this is that my, my agronomist answer of it depends, um, but consider what, what are you targeting with that seed treatment? And do you think you're going to have to target that disease or pest as you plant later, knowing your weather conditions and your field conditions? Thanks, Laura. Um, Jeremy, I know you're all a little different in, in the in the mid south. So, what what would you recommend in the mid south for that question? Yeah. So, you know, our typical recommendation is you know uh, insecticide, fungicide, seed treatment. You know, pretty much throughout the the planting window, uh, you may not see the benefit. You know, as much in the middle of the planting window. You know, when we have those really good soil conditions and we plant soybeans, good soil moisture, and the beans pop up out of the ground in four to five days. You know, we may not see the benefit, but really it's where it's on the extremes. You know, very early plantings, we see a benefit, and then later in the seasons, because then it's kind of like Laura was mentioning, it, it really kind of depends on the, the field and kind of the history, because, you know, early in the season, we're dealing with the, you know, Epithians and Phytophthora you know, species. And so, yes, typically when we have our wetter conditions, but here in the Mid-South, you know, later in the season, we deal with our rhizoctonia, you know, seedling diseases. And so we really try to, you know, tr try to protect as much as we can on the extremes. Um, but we do have some, you know, soil insect issues that, you know, we've seen a benefit with the insecticide uh, seed treatment. Uh, but again, it's kind of on those extremes, you know, if the seed sits in the ground early in the season for, you know, two, three weeks, you know, we just need to do everything we can to protect that, that seed. And then in the, at the end of the season, you know, some of the, the later season insect issues, you know, soil has gotten a little bit warmer. They're starting to get a little more activity in some of those soil borne insects. And so we really try to protect them, but, you know, here, here in the mid South, we've got, we've got some, quite a bit of data showing that we can really get some, some really good impact with insecticide, fungicide, seed treatments. Thanks, Jeremy. Now I'm gonna throw this out to all three of you and we'll start in the North and work our way South. Um, so the question is, um, what is the most profitable number of plants for a soybean field, all other things being equal? I'm guessing what uh, the question is referring to is if you could just drop a Go out there, plants, 
what do you need for a stand just to be the most profitable? So um, Manny, let's start in, in the north and work our way south. Yeah, that's a really, really good question. And I think it comes back to a little bit of this field specific aspect too, right? Uh, it might vary the number I think we all used to use was uh, that you have to have 100,000 plants, right? It's probably a good math number, you know, a good round, round of number. But I think in reality, for maximizing profitability, I think it's it's less than that. I think it's again that uh, maybe close to the threshold number even we are talking about. We have seen in a lot of our seeding rate trials that uh, as long as we have a stand that's around uh, 80, 75, 80,000 plants, you know, again, uniform distribution of that stand. Uh, and you can do that, right? Uh, with replant, you might have issues uh, with, uh, with gaps, you know, because of uh, whatever happened. But if you from get go, you are targeting uh, around that number 80 to 100K, I, I believe that's, that's maximizing your profitability. I don't think it's more than 100K. And we have, we have looked even under early planting conditions, not ultra early, but under early planting, you know, what that number looks like. And I believe since we are dealing with a higher yield potential, that number can be a little bit lower uh, because we have seen that in, uh, in, in soybeans, you know, if we have a high yield potential, we can get away with less number of plants. Under relatively low yield potential, that's where we need to be pushing for higher, right? Late planting and uh, even double cropping, things like that. We have seen that the number might be 140, 150K. But I think optimal planting, uh, Typical conditions around here, I think 80 to 100K probably will, will, will get you maximum dollars. Hopefully I'm close enough to you, Laura. I was gonna say, that's exactly what I would have said, Manny. Um, so I think usually that rule of thumb is you want at least 100,000 plants per acre, but you know I think if you go down to 80, I don't think there's an issue. Um, but I don't recommend people plant 100,000 mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. if you plant 100,000, you're probably not going to get 100,000. So I usually mm -hmm. um, recommend farmers in general plant 140,000 seeds per acre. And there can be some variability um, because you want to get to that 100,000 stand. So in soils that might have higher disease pressure or prone to soil crusting, you may need to go a little bit higher. If you have a field with maybe better emergence and conditions, you could go a little bit lower. Uh, I've seen in Ohio, sometimes farmers plant 140,000 seeds per acre and soil crusting is an issue and now they have 70,000 plants per acre. So going a little bit higher with your seeding rate gives you some extra insurance to ensure at least, hopefully you have somewhere between that 80 to 100,000 plant per acre range. Yeah, I would just, the same in the Mid-South. So, you know, Arkansas and Mississippi have done quite a bit of the seeding rate work and, uh, you know, me and Trent Irby feel real confident that 75,000, you know, uniform plant population is where we can maximize yield. Anything less than that, you know, we start to see a reduction in yield, but the key is, is uniform, you know, across the field. If you start to get, you know, pickup size truck areas where there's no plants or you get, you know, three, four or five foot skips, you know, within a row, that's really where we start to see uh, the impact in, in our yield. And so as long as it's, it's uniform, you know, I feel confident that 75,000 plants per acre, uh, you know, will maximize yield. But as Laura said, I, I can't tell you what the seeding rate is you need to plant to get that exactly 75 because, you know, each lot of seed, the germ is a little bit different. The vigor is a little bit different. The planting conditions are a little bit different. Um, you know, who knows if we're going to have, you know, a stretch of wet weather after we plant for five or six days and, and you know, we lose some stand, you know, due to seed rot and things like that. So as Laura said, I see, you know, our seeding rates kind of as a little extra insurance. And so, you know, typically, you know, here in, in Arkansas in the Mid-South, you know, that 140, 130,000 has kind of been where we've been for the last four or five years. So, you know, 35 or 75,000 be the, the the minimum, but, you know, we could go up to, you know, 100, 120 and still have relatively the same amount of yield. You know, you may see a 1% difference in yield, but, um, you know, as long as we got that 75,000, I feel confident we can maximize yield. Excellent. So I'll just throw this one out as just I want to see if there's any consensus in the group here. At what growth stage are soybeans too large to spot in? 
Like, is there a, once they get to a certain stage, say, whatever that is, are they too large? Any thoughts from uh, the peanut gallery? All right, I'll let Manny go first. I guess I should probably assign this so the people aren't waiting. So Manny, you go first and we'll work south again. Yeah, I I, I don't know. I think uh, to me, I think the yield potential is determined not by the length of the plant, if it's too tall or, or too small and things like that, right? I mean, I've seen again, if you are too tall, you can easily get, get lost. I think you need a good plant that has enough number number of nodes on 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 it uh, to maximize that number of seats per unit area so i don't know i mean our general rule of thumb is like before a pot filling begins you want to close your canopy so i don't know if that's adding much I want to say this is a very good question and one <laughs> yeah. that I have absolutely no data on. <laughs> so yeah. it's, that's a that's a really, really good question. I know aside from replanting, so just in general, sometimes you can have very uneven soybean stands where we'll have some at VE and maybe even, you know, V3 in the same field on the same planting date. So um, there is always kind of that unevenness. Where's the cutoff where that is? too divergent. I honestly don't have an answer for that. Maybe Jeremy or Yushan uh, do, but just in general, we'll have soybeans at different growth stages early on in the, the spring. Yeah, we did some replanting work a few years ago and, you know, we, we delayed the second planting by about three weeks. And so most of this, you know, plants were at that V2, not quite V3. Uh, but the, the challenge you run into is that, you know, unless you kind of off-center you know, where you're coming back in and planning, you know, a lot of the times you'll destroy, you know, quite a bit of the, of the original planning, I guess, you know, coming back and trying to do that replant. So you really need to kind of scooch over a little bit, you know, maybe not come exactly that back down, you know, that, that same, you know, uh, row, uh, but, you know, about that V2, V3 is about probably to cut off a, what I would feel comfortable with, you know, coming back with a replant, because if you get much more than that, you're, something's going to act more like a weed than, than a soybean. You're going to going to have a lot of uh, competition within the, in the, within the rows and then within that field, you know, with those delayed uh, emergence. Thanks. That kind of gets into Martha's question here is, um, how do you balance the damage of running over a good stand to fill in our holes? Is there a good good time frame either grow stage or if the plant uh how, how, how do you all think about that or what are your recommendations and we'll start we'll go sort south to north this time yeah i think you know i answered that a little bit but you know it's hard you know you know trying to fill in those holes you know especially in the bottom of the fields you know if the water got up have a you know a ditch or a bow or something and you lost part of the stand on the bottom of the field you know pulling in and backing up and pulling in and backing up just you know trying to plant you know an acre or two and sometimes you know it's just a challenge trying to to fill in you know some of these holes and gaps and but you know the disadvantage of not actually putting in something in there to try to get you know soil coverage is you're going to have weed problems, you know, in those areas. And so, you know, depending on how big they are and, and how challenging they are to, to get into the field, to get them filled in is, is probably going to be a, you know, a field to field basis on that. I don't think I have much to add on to what Jeremy said, um, except for it is challenging, but if you do have those big gaps, you know, weeds can really come up and get out of control in those areas. Uh, I know equipment size uh, can be really challenging. Um, I was talking to a farmer again, always in Northwest Ohio, uh, in Northwest Ohio, where he said that he can't really patch a field and to, to replant or repair plant because his equipment is too big and he has to just go through uh, the whole thing. But um, yeah, I, I agree with Jeremy and it, it's a challenge uh, to make those decisions. Yeah. And I don't think I have much else to add. I think we are getting bigger and bigger equipment uh, every year, right? So I think that's probably making it more, more challenging. But again, I believe so. I've been some more forgiving in that aspect, right? So even if you have variability in the, in the growth stage, I, I think we, we, we tend to see that a lot. So 
maybe not much we can do about it. Excellent. So I, I see we've got like 10 minutes left. So <clears throat> in order to try and get through all of our questions, at least the ones that don't have a lot of overlap, I'm just going to point to an individual to answer it. And then what we'll do is if someone disagrees, which I hope we do have disagreement, um, that makes it more fun, then someone can chime in. So um, question, I will throw this one to um, throw this one to Laura. If you offset a replant, how much should you offset to keep from destroying the existing stand? Um, and do you see a compaction effect? Well, <laughs> you know, in terms of, yeah, I know this is a great question, right? Um, in terms of compaction, you know, that's going to probably depend on your soil moisture, your equipment size and your soil moisture. So um, compaction is is detrimental um, to soybean root growth and the field in general. So consider the field moisture in your equipment when you do that. In terms of offset, I'm going to bounce that to Jeremy because he said he's done that and I haven't done that. Yeah, so, you know, we just moved our planter over, you know, about two inches. But again, it all depends on your closing wheels and your disc openers and things like that. So, you know, you may, you know, if you're planting flat, you may be able to come over halfway, you know, over and just come back down to center. You know, if you're on 30s, that means you're just going to have 15. So it all kind of really depends on, you know, what your equipment is and, you know, your the the wheels and things on your equipment. Excellent. Um, here's another question for, um, I'll go this one to Manny. Um, what are the benefits, if any, of planting soybean using variable rate seeding? Um, so question for you, Manny. Yeah, Laura and I have done some work on this few years back and uh, we did see some benefit, but I think that the tricky part is how you designed the prescription, right? I think the main benefit to me of variable rate is uh, I think we have talked about that. Uh, what gets us to that final stand, right? That 75, 80, 100,000 plants we are talking about. That's not V2, V3. That's at the time of harvest. And our field might have different attrition rates to get us to, to that point, right? So we might need to be planting some areas at a higher rate than, than others. So I think I see the value and it might be, I think sometime I even think, you know, maybe we overcomplicate uh, how we design the, the, the prescription, right? So just knowing where you have maybe higher attrition, highest end loss within the field, you bump it uh, up a little bit. Uh, and uh, where you don't have those issues, you can drop it down. So maybe buy the bag of seed, you know, 130K or whatever, you know, and drop it in a few places, uh, increase it based on, again, here, field history. And it probably shows up in, 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 in yield monitor data. I think that's the best I can I can think of. Thanks, Benny. So um, what we're going to do is some of these questions, we have some existing resources for. Uh, so we're going to drop just some links into the into the Q&A just so that we can um, get to some of the questions we might not have those specific resources for. And there's a couple near the end that were, are related to um, soybean traits and repelling deer. Um, and then uh, what I'll do is I'll kind of just uh, Put these two questions together and I'll throw them out to Jeremy and then I actually have a comment about this as well. So uh, Reed Pfeiffer asked how much research is being done in effort to come up with a soybean trait to repel there. And then in addition to that, uh, Jeff Lambert asked, will soybean plants that have had deer feeding damage to the terminal buds have the potential to generate a full plant canopy from axillary buds and sub sub subsequently yield similar to the undamaged areas in the field? So Reed, I'll make a quick question because we that's the advantage of having 22 members on the Science for Success team is that we were together last week in Orlando with Commodity Classic. And I do know in the Mid-Atlantic, there is some, actually some state legislation going on uh, to provide growers with some, um, some cost share to plant a forage soybean on the headlands and around the field in order to, and these forage uh, soybeans have a higher sugar content and they actually draw the deer in. So they're only feeding on those areas. So that's something you could talk to or speak with possibly your state, maybe N N NRCS or other groups to look at there's some cost share programs to that. And I do know that Jeremy deals with some issues in the, well, we all do with deer feeding. So what are your thoughts about damage and well, can they, um, 
generate a full canopy after they pull out that that term or that axillary meristemmer. Um, so, Jeremy, what do you think? On sure. That? Well, so on the the trait, I don't know of any trait that anybody's looking at, but you know there are some repellents, but a lot of them were short lived and you know really don't aren't that effective for an extended period of time. Uh, but the damage, you know, historically, you know, we can't plant early at our pine tree location just because of the deer damage. You know, if we try to plant early, we're typically the only beans in the county. And so, uh, you know, we've tried, you know, different things, just about everything you've heard of. Uh, we've tried uh, the best option we found is electric fence, but it's a pain to put up electric fence and then take it down to do what we need to do in the plots. Uh, but you know we've had quite a bit of damage over there um you know yields are reduced uh, and it all depends on how much they feed on those plants you know if they just feed on it once you know and it's able to put on auxiliary buds and and more branches the yields are you know somewhat typical of what you know a normal undamaged plant planting would be but if they just continue to feed on those you know plants for you know extended period of time I, I've got data showing that yes, the the yields are going to be reduced, and so really, it, it really depends on you know how much damage and how prolonged that damage is. But most of the time, it's coming in you know a little bit later in the seasons where we see the damage, and it, it really passed a point of really you know looking at a replant. All right, so in an effort to stay on time, there's four minutes left. I'm going to ask one final question, and then I will ask um, Dr. Rachel Van to come on, on and kind of finish this off here. So with that, um, here's my question, and I'll throw this to uh, Dr. Laura Lindsay because she's been doing some work with biologicals. Mm -hmm. The question is, if you're tight on time or soil conditions don't permit replanting, are there amendments or other foliar management practices that you'd suggest as a plan B or a get by for management practices to help offset a thin stand? Uh, I guess I will say no. <laughs> uh, I know that's not the um, answer that people like to hear. Um, you know, we've looked at polar fungicides, for example. Uh, we have flooded fields and the stand is poor and the soybeans are little and we apply fungicides. and really it doesn't it doesn't seem to help in terms of you know that silver bullet uh, that that can help um, I don't really think there's much much out there and available um, but I think you know it depends on what your stand is some people you hit 70,000 plants per acre and they get really really nervous uh, but I've seen multiple instances on farm where uh, producers, may only have 60,000 plants per acre, 50,000 plants per acre, they let it go. And it ends up not yielding as horrible as what they, they might think. Um, so, you know, there is, there is no magic bullet if you can't, can't go out there uh, and replant as far, as far as I'm aware of. Thank you, Dr. Lindsay. So for those of you that are CCAs, um, you'll see here your CCA QR code. Uh, there's one credit, a crop management credit for your CCA. And then if you do not have the app on your phone, we have left an email here for um, Jenny underscore Parleo at ncsu.edu. And I will uh, leave this up for a minute, or if you just want to snap a picture, uh, that way you will be able to go through. And what I'll do for the CCAs involved of an advance one slide so that uh, Dr. Rachel Van can finish this off and then I'll come back to this one so you can uh, get your QR code or the email for Jenny. So I will go advance to the next one and Dr. Van, the floor is yours to finish this off. Great. Well, we again want to thank everybody for joining us this afternoon. We had attendees from 19 different states and even Canada, which we were able to capture in that first pull, and that really represents the wide diversity of geographies that the Science for Success team represent in their applied research and extension priorities. 
So we'll hope you will join us for the next two webinars in this series. The next webinar will focus on planter technologies and the final webinar will focus on some fertility considerations and nitrogen fixation for soybean planting early in the season. So please plan to join us for subsequent webinars and don't forget to follow us on Twitter at Soybean Science One. We'll be providing updates uh, on production conditions, from across the United States and soybean growth and development uh, over the course of the 2023 season. So thank you for joining us this afternoon. Uh, and again, we'll emphasize the content of this webinar is available in the extension publication that was released by our team earlier this year. Have a great afternoon and again, happy St. Patrick's Day.